This video in the Local Ecosystem series looks at the following dot point. Compare the abiotic characteristics of aquatic and terrestrial environments. So before we go too far, let's have a look at what the two definitions or the definitions of the terms aquatic and terrestrial environments are. So the term aquatic has this prefix of aqua, so it usually refers to water. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of aquatic ecosystems. So we have an ocean, or in this case, a coral reef. We have rivers and lakes, uh, swamps, etc. And then we also have estuaries. So in an estuary, we have an area where uh, the river, uh, sorry, the river here, which is freshwater, meets the ocean. And what ends up happening here is we have a mix of freshwater and saltwater. And we'll be having a look at those quite um in depth as we move through the biology course both in year 11 and in year 12. And terrestrial environments are those that are on land. So a few examples, really basic. Uh, we have deserts obviously where we have quite dry and arid environment with quite warm temperatures. We have rainforests which are usually quite temperate and moist, in a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. And lastly, an alpine region. So these are only three examples of terrestrial environments. There's many, many more out there. These are just three to just give us an idea of the difference, just to refresh us between aquatic and terrestrial environments. Now, the terms abiotic and biotic, you've most likely heard in junior science, but let's just refresh our memory. So the term bio, whenever we see it, whether it's in the term biology, biosphere, um, biotic which is what we're looking at now simply refers to living therefore all biotic things are living or once living things and our abiotic are non-living so a few examples that we can have a look at so the availability of light in particular sunlight wind and air currents the availability of water ph and acidity so whether the soil or water that organisms are exposed to is um, acidic, uh, the topography, so whether it's hilly, whether there's valleys, the type of rocks that the land is made up of, fire, and salinity. So biotic things are those that are living or once living. So obviously plants are living organisms, animals, and we could name them but would be here all day if we decided to name a whole range of different plants and animals. We also have things like bacteria and fungi which can cause disease. And the idea of predation or competition between living organisms in order to be able to survive. Now, looking particularly at abiotic features, which is what the dot point is asking us for, it wants us to look at variations of these within the different types of ecosystems. So comparing uh, aquatic and terrestrial environments for each of these different abiotic factors. So the first one we're going to look at is viscosity. So viscosity is a measure of the stickiness of a substance and how easy or difficult it is to move through it. On land, plants and animals are surrounded by air, which has a very low viscosity and therefore is very easy to move through. Water has a much higher viscosity and it is more difficult to move through. And as a result, many aquatic animals are streamlined in shape. That aids with propulsion and usually they also have a quite powerful tail to help them move through. So the example here is a fish. So we can see that it's um, tapered at the mouth, which means it comes down to a point, and that helps to move the water over the, um, the top and the bottom of the fish. And the body of the fish and the tail is quite muscly in order to help it be able to move through the water. The next abiotic factor we're going to have a look at is buoyancy. Buoyancy is a measure of flotation ability. So water is very buoyant and supports plant and animal bodies against the pull of gravity. Aquatic organisms do not need strong stems or legs to hold them up like we see in quite a few of our terrestrial organisms. So terrestrial plants need strong stems or trunks of wood to grow upwards against gravity and animals need strong skeletons. So we can see in the picture here, this tree has quite a substantial trunk in order to hold the weight of the, uh, the leaves at the very top in place. Also, it would need to have quite an extensive root system in order to keep it upright. And um, animals such as this elephant here have 
quite a bony skeleton. So we have a bony skeleton as well in order to support us against gravity. If we didn't have the skeleton, we'd just basically be a puddle of mush on the ground. Next one is temperature variation. So on land, the temperature can vary um, easily vary, sorry, 20 degrees Celsius from day to night and even more from summer to winter. Living things must be able to cope with that while maintaining a relatively stable internal body temperature. Terrestrial animals need fur or feathers for insulation or have physiological responses such as sweating or shivering or alter their behaviour, whether they sunbake or seek shade in response to the heat or cold. We'll be having a look a lot more deeply at um, different adaptations, so structural, physiological or behavioural adaptations a little bit later. And in the Year 12 course, we'll be having a look at how important it is to maintain an internal body temperature. Water living organisms generally do not need such adaptations. Aquatic environments have very stable temperatures and change very little between summer and winter. So water is a lot harder to heat uh, than it is air. Uh, so organisms that live in the water don't have to deal with this as much. So the next one we're going to have a look at is the availability of gases and in particular oxygen and carbon dioxide. Since, there is, since the air is about 20% oxygen, it is readily available in terrestrial environments. Carbon dioxide, which is needed, for, needed by plants for the process of photosynthesis, is only 0.035% of air, so land plants are often limited by this. These gases do not dissolve well in water, so the concentration of gases in aquatic environments is very low and gets lower as the water gets warmer. For this reason, fish gills have to be highly efficient to extract the necessary oxygen and are far better than our lungs for gas exchange. So that's another adaptation of a different type of organism for a different type of uh, abiotic factor. The next one we're going to look at is the availability of water. So terrestrial environments are subject to evaporation and plants and animals must have ways to conserve water by having waterproof skin or avoiding losses during excretion. This problem becomes extreme in some environments such as deserts and we'll be looking at this quite a bit in the Year 12 course. In aquatic habitats, the organisms are surrounded by water but there can still be problems due to the process of osmosis. So osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane such as the cell membrane from an area where there's lots of water to where there's no water. So this is a real problem for fish that experience changes to the um, concentration of water around them, so changes in levels of salt. Water will either rush out of the fish or rush into the fish depending on where or what the changes are. In saltwater environments, animals can lose water by osmosis and must constantly replace it. And on the flip side, in freshwater, osmosis can cause water to flow into the organism's body and it must be constantly pumped out again. So this is because you think a freshwater, uh, sorry, a saltwater fish is surrounded by salty water. So the concentration of water is less outside the fish. So water is constantly leaving the fish. So the fish needs to drink to make sure that it keeps that water level up. Freshwater fish, our cells are slightly saline only a little bit, not completely fresh water. So water will rush into these fish and if these fish didn't excrete them constantly, they would basically drown themselves. The last abiotic factor we need to look at is the availability of light. So light is essential for plants to carry out the process of photosynthesis. We'll be having a look at photosynthesis in a little bit more detail later. This process makes all the food, so the availability of light is, cri is a critical factor in all ecosystems. Light penetrates through air very easily so most terrestrial environments get plenty of light for the plants. The floor of a rainforest is an exception. Here the dense canopy of trees means that very little light penetrates to reach the smaller species or seedlings and just like other organisms that we've looked at so far, uh, different rainforest plants have adaptations in order to deal with that. In contrast to air, water does not allow light through so easily. Light can penetrate the surface layers easily enough, but even just 10 metres deep, much of the light has been absorbed, and by 100 metres down, it is totally dark. 
Also, water does not absorb all the different colours or wavelengths equally. Red and orange are absorbed rapidly, while green and blue penetrate deeper into the water. Most seaweeds are not the familiar green of land plants. Many are brown or red because they contain special pigments to absorb the dominant blue wavelength of light they receive. In deep ocean waters, there is no light and consequently no plants. Deep ecosystems rely on dead organic remains drifting down from above for their food supply. On the deep ocean floor, some ecosystems are based on food made by chemosynthesis around volcanic vents. This will be explained in a later topic in year 11. So we can see here from this picture, we have the sun. The sun's rays are coming down and the sun's rays or the light from the sun is made up of seven different wavelengths of light. The seven different colors that make up a rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And each of these different colors penetrate the water at different depths. So red doesn't ve penetrate very far. It's absorbed quite near to the surface. Then as we move further along, the longer wavelengths move uh, deeper into the water and the blue light penetrates to a much greater depth. So many of the seaweed, seaweed sorry, that live deep in the ocean or a little bit deeper than sea level have special pigments in order to be able to absorb the available light. And that brings us to the end of looking at the um, differences or comparing the abiotic factors in terrestrial and aquatic environments. Thank you.